Hi, my name is Claire Thorne with Central State University Extension. My role is an Extension Associate within our Agriculture and Natural Resource Program area, and my focus today is to provide some information about starting and planning a veg vegetable garden, which is why you're viewing this presentation. My goal today is to talk about the values of gardening, what is involved in getting you started, whether you plan to garden traditionally in raised beds or containers. We will discuss various methods that might work best for you, discuss the right time to plant, discuss cool and warm weather crops, how to protect your transplant, transplant sorry about that, and how to extend the growing season. Throughout the growing season, there will be additional tasks to consider in maintaining your garden and the health of your plants. So I ask you, why garden? Is it for the fresh produce at your fingertips or would you like to store what you harvest by freezing or canning your surplus? Fresh vegetables are quite beneficial to your, your health, adding nutrients and antioxidants that may not be in your diet over the winter months. For many of us, becoming physically active in the spring allows us to enjoy time outside why gardening provides a modest amount of mental and physical therapy to put aside that emotional or stressful issues that you may be going through. Gardening also uh, provides a sense of well-being. Do you simply like to experiment with new varieties to see how they will do? For most of us, gardening provides enjoyment and a sense of accomplishment. Who knows, you may decide you have a green thumb after all. So what do you want to grow? Is it just vegetables? Maybe it's some herbs to add to your homemade dishes. What about growing small fruits like raspberries, blueberries, currants, or gooseberries? Companion plants make a nice addition to the garden, adding the benefits for the plants that grow well together, provide some pest resistance, and of course, some additional color. Each year, I try to grow something different that I haven't experienced before. Just as a suggestion, you may wanna do that as well. So let's talk about garden site requirements. This is one of the most important considerations for your garden, and that is the site location. Most vegetables require six to eight hours for full sun, of full sun. Next is considering how accessible the garden is and its location to a water source. You wanna make it easy for yourself when there hasn't been much rainfall. There are a few methods such as irrigation or slow release features. Most important is to consider the size of your garden. It is better to start small and expand year to year rather than to start way too big and not be able to maintain your garden space. It does take time to establish what works best for you. How much are you wanting to grow? Is it for personal enjoyment, your family, or expanded family? Who will help maintain the garden, and do you have the time? When it's time to harvest, what are your plans for the produce? So let's talk about cost. Does gardening have to be expensive? In my mind, no, it doesn't. If you plan to have a good size in-ground garden, then renting or perching a tiller may be necessary unless you have access to one, minimum twice a year, to prepare the ground in the growing season, and then to put your garden to rest in the winter. If you're quite resourceful and creative, as, a, as I am, then you may have other options at your fingertips. If you prefer a raised bed style garden, then you may be looking at tools such as saws, wood screws, and lumber to construct your boxes, although not all raised beds have borders. As for container gardening, securing the right size containers will be the task to purchase or collect. Tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant, for example, require a minimum five gallon container. Once you've decided on the style of the garden you want to have, 
you will need to decide on whether you want to start the plants from seed or to purchase from a nursery or garden center. When you decide on your plants, keep in mind the number of plants you will cultivate and the potential of each plant's ability to produce. An example, one tomato plant can produce a multitude at a time. Either plan to share the harvest, put up and in storage, but you may want to stagger your harvest times per crop. So let's look at some gardening methods. In this slide, you see typical traditional in-ground garden. Typically is what I grew up with at home. The picture on the left, the garden does have a border edge, but the crops are planted at ground level. The picture on the right is the garden of our summer pro program participants, which they began at their time on campus. Soil testing is recommended for all in-ground gardens to measure nutrients or possible contaminants. And we will take speak of that a little bit later in our presentation. Smaller spaced options would include square foot gardening, which is taking, uh, making space and dividing it into one foot by one foot grids to plant a variety of crops. Here, a number of limited plants can grow within the one foot square. In the next slide, I'll discuss a little further of how many specific plants can grow in that square. To the wide row method, you simply plant a, a wider row and it allows easier uh, harvesting. Beans work well in this circumstances. So let's talk about lasagna gardens. Here, they are typically created without borders layering nitrogen-rich or carbon-providing materials such as leaves, grass clippings, straw, and properly aged manure. Raised beds with a border are constructed of wood, cinder blocks, or other materials, then adding good quality soil, humus, compost, and manure to fill the above ground space. Vertical gardening, which is on our left lower part of the slide, is a space saving technique which allows you to grow plants upright rather than low to the ground for easier harvesting. So pole beans, cucumbers, squash, and gourds will grow rather well. Lastly, container gardening is a convenient method that allows you to move your containers to the right growing conditions with little ease. Pictured here are 15 gallon containers, a vertical tower, and a material mesh raised bed with a trellis. You can see other containers include a metal wash tub. Using what is on hand or finding a variety of containers will allow you to garden on a much smaller scale. Since the initial start of my container garden, fencing to prevent squirrels has been added as insurance to enjoy my harvest, something you may need to keep in mind. Some other gardening ideas would include straw bale gardening, patio gardening with elevated containers, and the use of root pouches that are reusable for a number of seasons. So what are the advantages of raised bed gardening? Both methods, and as I mentioned earlier, square foot gardening, are techniques to garden in limited space, which can include container gardening. But as for raised beds, there are a number of reasons to choose this style. One, for the ease of elevated height, not requiring to bend over and stressing your back. Two, the soil warms faster, therefore you can plant sooner. Three, you may have a better yield. Four, the general, excuse me, <laughs> the soil generally has a better drainage and provides better root due to aeration, obtain, uh, allowing the roots to obtain uh, the nutrients and organic materials. 
And five, in general, you'll experience less weed and pest issues. Sorry about that. I'm going to go back to square foot gardening. So some of you have attended my initial starting seeds and door session, and you had questions with square foot gardening. So I'm just going to briefly share with you the advantages of square foot gardening. You can either create your uh, foot, square foot grid to plant your crops, and you can either plant by seed or the plants you get at a nursery. Each square foot can support most crops to a successful harvest as long as you don't overplant the grid. For example, as the chart indicates, the number of plants of a particular crop are in that square foot. If you would like to try this method, one square foot per tomato plant or pepper plant or eggplant, cabbage, broccoli, or cauliflower. Looking at this plan, you can see what is recommended for carrots onions, cucumbers, which I should recommend the bush type. They won't get all leggy and grow outside of the box, and a number of herbs. You can be creative with what you grow by reading the space requirement for each crop on the seed packet. One thing to keep in mind is planting the taller plants in the back of the grid so as not to block the sun or to create too much shade. With all garden styles, it is best to plant in the north-south direction so that the sun moves, as the sun moves east to west, the plants are getting as much sunlight as possible. In this slide, you may refer to the link for additional information on square foot gardening. So let's talk about plant hardiness. The next couple of slides, I'm going to show you a few maps to help guide you with what to plant and the time to plant. This particular map indicates the hardiness zone or whether a plant will do well in your particular growing area. In our part of Ohio, we are typically considered to be zone 6A, 5B, according to this 2012 map. For the most part, we are 6A with an occasional dip into winter temps of negative 10 to negative 5 degrees. However, for example, Central Florida is zone 9B, so we could not expect a plant, a plant to survive our winters here, so plants would be considered to be an annual or a tropical plant and we would need to bring them inside during the winter months. Here the hardiness map is showing for Ohio. And you can see, particularly depicting Montgomery and Greene counties, or whatever county you may live, and matching it to the color scale, that we are in zone 6A with an average extreme temps of negative 10 to five degrees in winter. Now let's talk about the plant heat zone map. This map indicates our heat zone, which is typically again, five, six, with the average number of days per year above 86 degrees. We can average greater than 30 to 45 days for zone five and greater than 45 to 60 days for zone six. So warm weather crops will only do well in Ohio during this time frame. We will talk a little more about warm weather crops shortly. Apologize, we're going to go back a slide. Now that you have an understanding of our plant heat and hardiness zones, we can begin to learn when we can begin to plant directly in our gardens by temperature and the chance of last freeze. Using the chart I provided in the previous presentation, compares this planted guide along with when to plant seeds indoors and to when to transplant or directly sow and plant in the garden when temperatures are appropriate. Keep in mind which are cool and warm weather crops.
Extending your growing season can be accomplished in a number of ways. Pictured here is a cold frame which provides warmth and protection to start your early crops or to use a frost cloth or barrier cloth to directly cover small seedlings or create small hoops to keep the cloth from making contact with the plant. The heavier cloth protects from frost. The sheer cloth provides from early insect damage. So let's talk about planting, uh, excuse me, protecting your plants. Besides using cold frames and frost cloths, and I failed to mention the gold, cold frame in the previous slide, but you may choose to plant early and use this type of protection for individual plants or ones that are more closely together. These would need to be removed on warmer days and place, replaced on cooler evenings. You don't want your plants to wilt or die from excessive heat during the day or a sudden drop of temperatures at night. This wire protection is more for rabbits. So these are individual um, covers to protect your plants as you um, establish your, your garden that you can use in that early season. These are simply additional um, options um, with cloches with venting ability or opening the, the top of the one that is pictured in the right. The lower left is what um, I grew up calling a wall of water. And basically you fill these individual cells with water. And during the day, those cells warm the ground temperature and provide the warmth for your plant. And again, at night, you may have to try to close that a little bit, but most important is to make certain during the rising day, day temperatures, excuse me, you will need to make those adjustments. So what if you're on a limited diet, excuse me, a limited um, income, I apologize for that, um, and you might be rather resourceful. If you like recycling, items and repurposing them before they hit that recycle bill, bill, bin or the trash can, then a couple of these ideas may work for you. Simply milk jugs or juice jugs will help provide some plant protection. So let's talk about succession planting. Have you heard of that? Basically, what it is, is that as a crop is harvested, you simply reuse your, that same garden space by replacing with another crop. So let's take a look at a few examples. So in mid to late March, <clears throat> perhaps you planted sugar snap peas. You would harvest them by May, and you would replace them with sunflowers, okra, carrots, and beans. Keep in mind the early frost or the last spring frost date is around May 15th. So you will also want to judge your plantings according to that date. Perhaps in late March, you plant broccoli and Chinese cabbage. You would harvest these in May and will replace with your tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers. Again, keep in mind that last frost date in the Miami Valley is considered May 15th. Sometimes Mother Nature will play tricks with us though and you get excited when the warm season starts and you get crazy with your plants and unfortunately if you don't protect them you will lose them and it will also shock them and they'll have a hard time regaining their abilities. Okay, so maybe you wanna to try to go for three crops in a season. So in late March, early April, you'll plant some greens, radishes, red beets. You'll harvest by May, replace with corn. In late July, that corn should be ready and you can get ready for a, a fall garden with broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, and in this case, ornamental kale. 
which isn't edible, but does make a lovely addition to your garden. Also in late March and early April, you can plant your potatoes. You'll be digging them up in July and you can replace again with your greens for the fall harvest. So let's look at plant selection and what you wanna grow in your garden. When selecting your crops, you'll wanna read the seed packet or the plant label to know how many days it will take before it's ready for harvest. Varieties of the same crop may have different harvest times, so when planning, you can select varieties that have a different harvest time so that you don't have an overabundance or plan to share. Some crops may be easier to grow than others. Do you want something that is disease resistant? Some plant labels will indicate if they are disease resistant to some common issues. Would you like to grow heirlooms or hybrids? For some, heirlooms have better flavor or they want to grow heritage plants for the sake of just growing heritage plants. You can save seeds from heirlooms and pass them on to future generations or swap seeds with others. Hybrids are a cross between two plants chosen for their specific qualities and tend to be disease resistant. Seeds cannot be saved since you will only get the quality of one parent plant. How much you grow determines your harvest as to how you will use it. Will you use it fresh? Will you can it, freeze it, dry or dehydrate? So much to consider. And hey, why not try something for fun? So what is the difference between heirlooms and hybrids? Here in this chart, you can see that heirlooms are open pollinated and we can save seed. You're keeping uh, plants from many years ago alive by passing them from generation to generation. The flavor, as some feel that it has a much better taste. They do grow in unique forms and colors. And a little bit to a disadvantage is they may have a lower yield and they are disease susceptible. So hybrids are produced by crossing one tomato plant, say, with another tomato plant. They both have qualities that you like, but you wanna make it stronger by hybridizing. These plants, you cannot save the seeds. As I mentioned before, you only get the qualities of one parent or the other. When shipping, the quality of the tomato does last much longer than heirlooms. You usually get uniform sized fruit, consistent production, generally higher yields, and they are disease resistant. So consider your options. Why not experiment with both and determine your preference? So now let's talk about the cool season crops. These are crops that you can plant prior to the last frost date. They can germinate and grow at lower temperatures during the spring and fall and are not injured by a light frost. Cool weather crops would include crops like lettuce, kale, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, sugar snap peas, and radishes. Cool season vegetables that tend to do better as a transplant would be broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, celery, kale, leafy greens, and onion sets. They actually do well either as seedlings or tran transplants. So starting by these, uh, some of these by seeds is suggested. Here's another way to look at cool season crops. 
as to whether or not you want to start indoors or direct seed. On the top portion of the slide, it shows those that you can start indoors, both hardy vegetables and semi-hardy vegetables. And then the lower half of the slide indicates those crops that tend to do a little bit better when you directly sow them into the ground. So I'm talking about now the direct seed, just like you saw pictured in that slide. And those that would do well would be beets, carrots, leafy greens, onions, parsnips, turnips, peas, potatoes, and radishes. Are you ready to discuss now warm season vegetables? These are the plants that are planted on or after the last frost date. I do apologize that this last slide or two has been a little bit off, and I apologize that the printing is over the other. But warm season crops are those that germinate and grow at warmer temperatures during late spring and summer and will be injured by frost. Warm weather crops, again, must have much warmer air temperature and soil temperatures, which include tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, squash, cucumbers, and beans. Those that do well as transplants include eggplants, peppers, tomatoes, and sweet potato slips. So warm season crops that you would directly see, again, the ground is warmer, so is the air temperature. So they prefer to go directly into the ground, which would be your beans, cucumbers, melons, okra, pumpkins, squash, and sweet corn. Some of these crops you might find already uh, planted in seed trays at nurseries and there's nothing wrong with trying those um, varieties. So let's talk about crop families and why it's important to know what variety is in those families. So when you're planning your garden, keeping a journal, keeping a layout from season to season, you'll know how to rotate your crops to help preventable diseases. Each family will be affected by soil bacteria, environmental conditions, so your prevention and treatment methods will be similar also based on families. So in the goosefoot family would be your beech, chard, and spinach. In your mustard family, cabbage, collards, Brussels sprouts, kale, cauliflower, broccoli, kohlrabi, rutabaga, turnip, turnip, <laughs> cress, horseradish, and radishes. Parsley includes your carrots, the herb parsley, celery, and parsnip. Nightshades are your potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers. Gourds include your squash, pumpkin, watermelon, cantaloupe, and cucumber. Composite family includes your chicory, endive, salsify, dandelion, lettuces, Jerusalem artichoke, globe artichoke, and sunflowers. In the lily family would include your onion, garlic, leek, and chives. Grasses, sweet corn, and mallow is okra. So here I've provided an example garden that you can plan out. The website is here so that you can uh, go to this link and look at um, garden layouts, but it is um, uniquely based on the gardener, which is perfectly okay. But at this point, when you're laying out that garden, you should know where you want to have the garden. Is it receiving that six to eight hours of full sun? So lay it out, keeping a few things in mind. In this particular um, plan, it's divided into work, four working areas. So for example, if you decide to go with square foot gardening, 
you want to have it just wide enough that you can work across either side at an arm's length, no wider than four feet. Even with this style pictured in this slide, you'll be able to work from all sides, making taking care of the garden much easier. You'll want to develop a pattern on how you will work the garden or water it without having to step over or through your plants or drag the hose through the garden, which will damage your plants. As a reminder, planting north-south allows the proper sun exposure and keeping taller plants from casting shadows on smaller plants. So why is it important to keep a journal? And I would need to go back a slide and document where your plants were from the previous season. One, I can promise if you don't, after year after year of gardening, you're bound to forget which crop you planted where. And two, you need to rotate your crops every three to four years to reduce and prevent soil diseases from getting out of control. Crop rotation for family crops allows you to minimize what affects your nightshade crops, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, and potatoes, for example. By spreading the plants throughout the garden, you minimize the bacteria in the soil from becoming so densely populated that affects the health of your plants. What I've shared is true with other family crops. So to minimize health issues, you must rotate. So what are some things that you can do to help prevent weeds from getting out of control and or diseases from flourishing. It's important to keep your weeds down to a minimum to reduce the competition, first of all, for the nutrients being taken away from the plants that you're growing. You simply don't want those weeds to steal those nutrients. In a small garden, keeping up with the weeds is much easier than a larger garden. Start early in the growing season, especially if your seedlings are small when you plant and keep with that routine. You simply don't want those weeds stealing from your precious plants and all the work, hard work and effort you've put into your garden. Practice hand removal of any weeds as much as possible to help reduce soil and root disturbance of your plants. Using newspaper, cardboard, mulch, grass clippings can help provide a barrier from weeds being able to germinate, and as it breaks down, adds organic matter to your garden for better soil texture. If you must use other forms of control, such as pesticides or herbicides, start with the softer chemicals to first reduce the chance of resistance. So, for example, um, you can use a spray of water to reduce pests being on a plant or maybe soapy water before going to um, stronger chemicals. As we get further into the growing season, you must make certain your garden is receiving proper amount of moisture so that your garden thrives. Keep in mind, as you start your garden, your newest seedlings will require even moisture to get off to a healthy start. General rule is to, that plants require one inch of water per week. Too much water, the plants become waterlogged, diseased, or die. Too little water, your plants will produce a lower yield. Morning watering is best, not in the heat of day to prevent evaporation or to stress your plants. So how do we manage insects and diseases? When it comes to insects in the garden, there are two kinds, beneficial insects like ladybugs, praying mantis, butterflies, and bees. These are used either for warfare or pollination. Ladybugs eat aphids. Praying mantis eat other pests. Bees and butterflies serve as pollinators for your crops. 
using your these following steps you should have a healthy garden and plants one monitor your plants daily to watch for any insect damage it is amazing but cabbage worms can do devastating damage overnight to your cabbage collagen kale and other greens learn what beneficial insects look like in all metamorphic stages and definitely get to know some of the pests knowing the potential diseases your plants may experience or show signs of to these diseases such as powdery mildew or verticillium wilt so your cucumbers your squashes pumpkins would be susceptible to powdery mildew so be prepared and what you should do to take care of those verticillium wilt generally affects your tomato plants so be prepared to know how to deal with that problem try to identify try to identify the problem before blasting your garden with chemicals as i mentioned before some issues can be handled by a good stream of water or soapy water. You may ask a garden center for help to identify what problem you may be having. This helps you know what your control options are. When using a pesticide or herbicide, please use according to label instruction as it is the law. A contract between you, the user, and the company. If you use it in a way that is not meant to be used, or something that is not meant to be used on, it will become your fault if something goes wrong. So I mentioned monitoring your plant health here in this slide shows you some leaf damage yellowing of leaves darkening leaves as examples and as you read the screen um, you can see what each leaf is depicting for you in this case so it could be um, manganese with yellow spots or elongated holes between the veins it could be an iron deficiency so where your young leaves are looking yellow or whitish but your mature leaves are normal calcium deficiencies look like the young leaves are misshapen or stunted so take a good look at this slide to see what kind of um, problems you can possibly look for not only are you monitoring your plant health, you should, and it is recommended, to get a soil test. Here is a link to Ohio Line, which gives you a fact sheet that gives you the information as far as soil testing and how about going it, going about and, and taking your sample. So basically, um, you'll just want to know what is in your soil so that your plants have the proper nutrients for growth, root development, and production. Just dumping fertilizer on the soil within your garden, you may be adding nutrients and spending money when it's not necessary because you may be applying the wrong amounts. So again, don't guess, soil test and in that fact sheet will provide you a number of labs that will provide you an analysis report within that soil test you'll receive the pH of your soil it will allow you know, to know whether you would need to apply sulfur or calcium to help release the stored nutrients in the soil in this particular area of Ohio the Miami Valley Montgomery Green in such counties 
our soil is considered more alkaline due to our limestone, excuse me, limestone bedrock. Our calcium is locked, however, because our soil is heavy clay. While clay is good compared to sand, the clay tends to lock up the calcium and doesn't release it to the plants. Adding organic matter helps break up the clay structure, which allows your plants then to take up the nutrients and water more efficiently through their roots. So you have questions um, with your garden. You're having problems. Um, this link provided, actually there's two links, will connect you with master gardeners who have received extensive horticultural training through, your, through local land grant universities. Uh, another fantastic resource is Ohio Line. Ohio Line has a number of fact sheets available, best yet at no cost, that you can download, print, and keep for yourself. Not only are they on gardening, food, and horticulture, but you can see the options you have here. I've highlighted in yellow, which would be beneficial to you. That would be home, yard, and garden, and insects and pests. Check it out. So for today's pre uh, presentation, that brings me to conclusion. And I have provided a number of websites and resources in creating my presentation, all of which you may want to check out to gain further information for your own background knowledge. And at this time, I'd like to say goodbye. Thank you for joining me. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me by phone or by email, and I will help you out as best as I am able. Thanks again, and have a great day.